Britain's first heart transplant patient for five years died three hours ago in Papworth Hospital near Cambridge. 44-year-old Charles McHugh from South Croydon in Surrey hadn't regained consciousness since his operation 17 days ago. His condition deteriorated rapidly over the past few days. Here's David Wilson. Mr McHugh was a very sick man before his heart transplant. Indeed, that would be the justification for performing the operation. It was admitted that twice during the preparation for the transplant, Mr McHugh had suffered a sharp fall in his blood pressure. Both times this was immediately corrected. But when he failed to recover consciousness in the first three or four days after the operation, the fears grew that he had suffered some brain damage during these crises. He did, however, begin to show some signs of recovery in the ensuing week, even though he has remained on a breathing machine. His doctors remained cautiously optimistic, especially since the transplanted heart was performing well. However, in the last few days, his condition had deteriorated rapidly. Papworth Hospital in Cambridgeshire is the regional specialist centre for heart and lung operations, with a big reputation for open heart surgery. Mr McHugh's operation was not a sudden decision. The hospital team had been preparing for over a year. The surgeon, Mr Terence English, who personally collected the transplant heart from the donor, a young journalist fatally injured in a car smash, said he thought the time was ripe for a series of heart transplants. The problem was where the funds for the operations would come from. The question now is whether just one first disappointment will change the outlook for heart transplantations in Britain. The TUC General Secretary, Mr Len Murray, has called in the leaders of the four health service unions to discuss the growing industrial action in Britain's hospitals. Almost half the country's 2,300 hospitals have been forced to operate an emergencies-only service, and Mr Murray wants to know what progress has been made in pay talks for the quarter of a million ancillary workers and ambulance servicemen. The union leaders will see Mr Murray only an hour before they go on to Whitehall for another urgent meeting, this time with the Social Services Secretary, Mr David Ennells. This morning, the Secretary went to the Queen Elizabeth Children's Hospital in Hackney, East London, to see for himself what conditions are like. Infective uh, rubbish and the dangers of this created for infection, uh, though uh, other staff have had to do it up to today, the unions this morning cooperate, and I hope they'll continue to the cooperate. What the health service, service unions your... have drawn up a code of conduct. Yes. Is, is that acceptable in your view? Well, uh, you mean the one in this hospital? No, the nationwide. Well, as you know, conduct. this evening I'm seeing uh, Alan Fisher and Albert Spanswick, the two general secretaries, and obviously I'm discussing with them both their own code of conduct and also other points that I want to put to them. So I certainly wouldn't say I'm satisfied. I think it's a very important uh, step forward. I think the union leaders are absolutely recognised that there are great dangers, that uh, people will take very irresponsible actions. And I think they're very anxious to ensure that emergency services are properly provided. What is the purpose? Local authority manual workers are continuing their industrial action after the breakdown of pay talks yesterday. The disruption by dustmen in particular is becoming serious in London. In some boroughs, the local authorities have had to take emergency measures, as Richard Whitmore reports. Many of London's 32 boroughs are now organising a do-it-yourself refuse disposal operation, in which householders and traders have to seal their rubbish in plastic bags and take it to special collection sites. Others are attempting to reduce problems from the outset by employing private contractors to supply skips. But elsewhere, the situation is getting more serious. In the heart of the city, although emergency sites are available there too, traders are beginning to pile their rubbish on pavements and in backyards. This despite the fact that public health departments have been circulating information leaflets, telling people where to take their refuse and where they can collect new plastic bags. There's still no sign of a general return to work by the lorry drivers, but in Tyneside and Wearside this morning, the men have voted to accept the employer's £64 pay offer, and drivers in Southampton have stopped picketing the docks, but in the northwest, talks have broken down. Efforts to find some common ground between the government and the trades unions on the pay issue are continuing. This morning, the TUC Economic Committee was attended by government ministers, including Mr Michael Foote, the Chancellor, Mr Healy, and Mr Booth, the Employment Secretary. The ministers have been discussing with the trade union leaders on the committee wider economic issues, as well as the current problems of pay and prices. It's expected there'll be several more similar meetings. The Conservative leader, Mrs Thatcher, said today she would support a pay freeze when things got very bad. 
On BBC Radio's Jimmy Young show, Mrs Thatcher said an emergency freeze might be needed for a short time, followed by one phase of pay restraint. But long-term policies had caused the present problems, with the government saying X percent, brother, take it or leave it. Abroad now, and thousands of Iranian troops moved into the streets of Tehran this morning, less than 24 hours before the return of the Ayatollah Khomeini. It was announced a short time ago that the Muslim leader will now leave Paris sometime after 10 o'clock tonight to return to Iran after 15 years in exile. He aims to abolish the monarchy and establish an Islamic Republic. Rumours of a coup swept through Tehran as the troops gave a surprise display of military might. But first indications were that it was only a last-ditch show of force by the soldiers, most of whom still support the absent Shah. Meanwhile, Bahrain has become the main staging post for thousands of foreign nationals now being evacuated from Iran. Three Hercules transporters belonging to the Royal Air Force left Tehran for Bahrain this morning. They're carrying about 200 Britons and other foreigners. In Rhodesia, the overwhelming support for a new constitution in yesterday's referendum has been greeted jubilantly by members of Mr Ian Smith's transitional government. But Mr Smith now faces a new challenge. He has to seek outside recognition for a black majority government in which whites will retain considerable influence. 85% of the white electorate voted for the constitutional changes, leading to one man, one vote elections on April the 20th. I am delighted that... Uh the white electorate has been very cooperative, unlike the British government, which has taken a very negative attitude. Do you think you're going towards independence with no further difficulties now? Sure. We shall move on from now on uh, with more speed and more certainty than we have done in the past. Bishop Monroe was quoted this morning as saying that Britain will have no alternative but to recognise uh, an independent Rhodesia or Zimbabwe once the election comes. Is that your feeling too? That's my feeling too. You see, the only reason for non-recognition of the present setup is that um, um, there is UDI, there is the 1969 Constitution, which is based on racial discrimination. Uh, there is minority rule. There is no majority rule, but once majority rule is established, once one man, one vote has been exercised, and once indi um, sovereign independence has been set up, then there is no moral reason whatsoever for Britain not to recognize the new regime. Plans have been announced to bring to the surface the ship that was once the pride of Britain's navy, Henry VIII's Mary Rose. Underwater surveys have shown that the ship, lying on the seabed near Portsmouth, can be raised, and Prince Charles has agreed to help find the cash for the operation. Tim Hurst reports. The Mary Rose sank in 1545 during a review of the fleet by Henry VIII. She's lain preserved in the mud of the Solent for 400 years. We have to set up a, a formal trust so as to be able to receive money and deal with... Uh, contracting people and lifting vessels and all that. So we've now got a formal body of which His Royal Highness has today announced that he will be uh, the president. And anyone who know, knows His Royal Highness knows he doesn't do such a thing lightly. It means he's going to take a very lively interest indeed. The latest objects to be brought ashore from the wreck are remarkably well preserved, but they have, after all, been sealed for four centuries in a Tudor time capsule. Because she's totally buried in the silts, nothing sticks above the seabed. The half of the ship, which is buried in these muds, is very, very well preserved. She lays right over on her starboard side, and we have the starboard side preserved right up to the bow castle and to the stern castle. When do you think the public will get their first sight of the ship? I firmly believe it was sometime in the summer of 1981. England's cricketers have a great chance of winning the Adelaide Test and with it the series. Their batsman, led by Bob Taylor, made 360. Taylor was out to the last ball before lunch for 97, just short of his first Test century. Australia's batsmen were soon in trouble with Darling bowled by Botham, but by the close they'd rallied to 82 for two, still needing 284 to win with one day left. And the England batsman Geoffrey Boycott is to stay with Yorkshire, the team that sacked him as captain last year. He was given until today to accept a two-year contract as a player with the club. 
Boycott said he'd given his life to Yorkshire cricket and he wanted to see the team he'd helped build go on and win. In Yorkshire, Tim Hewitt asked the club chairman if there might be friction between Boycott and his successor, Jackie Hampshire. Well, I hope not. I mean, they're both grown-up men and um, they have a set of circumstances to deal with it and they ought to be careful of dealing with it. I remember talking to you a couple of months ago when this first came up and at that time you did profess to feeling that two or three players might leave the club were boycott to return. This was, uh, I think, a possibility, yes. Does it remain a possibility? Oh, no, I don't think so, no, because this was entirely related to Jeffrey Boycott being the captain of the team as a member of the team. That's quite a different proposition altogether. The weather is still disrupting soccer and several of tonight's matches have been postponed. Scotland already has some of the worst fixture congestion and tonight's cup ties at Rangers, Dumbarton, Hibernian, Morton and Ayr are all off. The bigger Scottish clubs are now feeling the effects financially, as David Cass reports from Edinburgh. Few Scottish clubs retain full-time playing staff. For those like Heart of Midlothian who do, the weekly wages bill is around £3,000. Total running costs are 5000 so when there's no gate money coming in, the problems are great. Although the pitch is fit for training, the last match at Tynecastle was a month ago. The Scottish League has advanced £140,000 to tide the clubs over, but there's little hope of recovering income lost from cancelled Saturday games. Well, it's definitely going to hit, hit us financially-wise because, uh, as you say, the Saturday is a the day they'll all turn out, whereas midweek a lot of people work at nights and by the time they get home they just can't be bothered coming out on Wednesday night. The Scottish season always starts before the English one, but how tough do you think it's going to be to complete the programme without lengthening the season, given the fact that uh, worse weather might be coming? Well, it's possible we could still have bad weather, especially up here, uh, but I feel that the league, as they've done before, uh, they have lengthened uh, the season. It all depends on the weather again. If, if the weather still continues to be as bad as it has been, um, I don't see us getting it finished in time for the end of the season, but uh, there will be no problems. I think another week or a fortnight can see it through. And it's not only the big professional clubs that have been hit. The amateur game here in Scotland has probably suffered even more. Some leagues have already announced that their programme will have to run until August if it's to be completed, and that'll clash with next season's fixtures. So, football looks like becoming an all-year-round game here in Scotland in 1979. David Cass up in Edinburgh. And that's the lunchtime news, and we're back again at 5.40. Let's look at the nationwide weather picture from Michael Fish. Good afternoon to you. Well, despite the fact that temperatures today are far higher than they've been for some considerable time in many parts of the country, we're certainly not out of the woods yet. It does look as if very gradually in the next day or so it's going to turn cold again over most parts of the country. And indeed, bad news, I'm afraid, for the uh, football managers in the north. For the month of February as a whole, there's a good deal of very cold weather on offer, a fair bit of snow as well, especially in the south. Although with a bit of luck, I think we're going to see rather more settled weather than we did in January. As far as today's picture is concerned, we have two things of interest to show you. First of all, this frontal system that's edging down very slowly from the north, bringing colder northerly winds into those northern parts of the country. And we also have frontal systems down to the southwest that are trying to edge up towards southwestern parts. And if we look at this morning's satellite picture, you'll see, I think, both those systems shown there quite nicely. First of all, here's the cold front out there to the west, curling back and becoming a, an occlusion further north there. There's the sort of meeting point of the warm and cold fronts just there to the east of Scotland, and a much more marked great mass of white cloud down to the southwest. That's those frontal systems that are trying to push in. So as far as today's weather is concerned, in the far north of Scotland, already behind that cold front, so fairly bright for the rest of the day, one or two wintry showers. In Northern Ireland and southern parts of Scotland, that cold front, fairly slow moving at the moment, admittedly is giving a fair bit of cloud. Rain will soon get into Northern Ireland and there's a rain around in southern Scotland as well at the moment. And very gradually I think you're going to find during the course of the afternoon and first part of the evening that this area of rain works its way slowly southwards and as it comes across the high ground, say in North Wales or the Pennines, you're going to find some sleet or snow coming out of it. Somewhat clearer weather eventually getting into these uh, Northern Ireland and southern parts of Scotland. Over the rest of England and Wales, a dry afternoon, a fair bit of cloud around, but here and there, a little bright bit of brightness, the odd glimmer of sunshine. And as you see from the temperature levels, at least over England and Wales, quite a bit higher than of late, not far off normal, around the uh, low 40s Fahrenheit, although in the north of Scotland, all the while, it will gradually be turning colder. 
And then for this evening and tonight, well, still some uh, rain or sleet around perhaps to begin with in these more southern parts of Scotland and through northern England, but all the time that's going to be working its way southwards into the rest of England and Wales, so that uh, in the north for much of the night it'll be fine and dry, there'll be quite a widespread sharp frost again, just one or two wintry showers coming in on those northwesterly winds to those north-facing coasts. Also, I think you're going to find later on in the night in that southwestern part, those frontal systems will bring in some rain, and eventually, too, some rain getting into the southeast. So most parts having some rain overnight. And that's it. A very good afternoon.